I bet you $1 million that you could learn piano or really any skill in life. Cancel your $10 a month to Netflix and like cancel this and cancel this, but like if you want to get like rich, you gotta like make more money. All the information you need is right there at your fingertips on Google and Facebook and YouTube and online uh, courses and forums and blog posts. Information is no longer the issue. If you wanna do YouTube, like I know how the algorithm works. I've studied it. I've tested so many different videos on it. I kind of know how to win. Can you give us some tips? So today I have Zach Evans in the studio and we're going to have a phenomenal conversation about how he's built his business, um, which he started when he was about 19 years old. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a, I'm sure it's a, it's a story which has been told over the, over the ages, um, how a musician rises to, to be, you know, at the forefront of their career. And in his case, he actually created a company out of it and he's uh, built some courses. So we're going to dig into that. Um, but I, I always like to start off by just asking you to you show yourself quickly to the audience and we can take it from there. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name's Zach. I play piano. Uh, yeah, I started back when I was in kindergarten, grew up playing. My grandpa was my first piano teacher, that kind of thing, and ended up doing it in college and eventually making a business off it. So That's great. And it's, it's a seven-figure business. You're built from scratch. Yep. It's yep. uh, impressive. Um, Thank you. And you you have no investors, you did it yourself? Or yep, you, all just bootstrapped. Just bootstrapped and grinding away. Yeah. That's great. Yep. There's a bunch of old stories I'm gonna dig in and find out from you. Um so why don't you just tell us what the company does uh exactly and how do you how do you monetize it? What do you what do you sell? Yeah, so basically it's an online piano course. So people go to my YouTube channel, get a bunch of free lessons, and then they sign up for uh, whether it's a cheat sheet or whether it's the free piano course. And if they like that one, then there's the premium options available. You can sign up for those, and then that's pretty much how I monetize it. Great. So you basically use YouTube, and you've got 600,000 um, subscribers right now? Yep. yep. A as a way of attracting new customers to your business. Yeah, so it's about probably 75 to 80% organic through YouTube, and then about 20 25% through paid advertising. Okay, wow. Yeah. That's, that, that's phenomenal. Um, so let's go back. This is... You know, go back a bit. Um, okay. So you, you were you finished high school, mm -hmm. and then what? How did you how did you stumble upon this opportunity for yourself? Yeah, so college started off just posting cover videos on YouTube. Okay. Oh, playing this Justin Bieber cover song tracks, on yeah. piano, that kind of thing, and posted a video pretty much every week for about like four or five years. Wow, and that's some determination. What keeps you going? Man, it's like every time you think it's just around the corner. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. Part of it, too, was I just enjoyed it because you post yeah. it, your friends think it's cool, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's fun. You know what yeah. I mean? But then there's definitely some part, okay, maybe this is the video that pops off, and this is the one that gets me all the subscribers, X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, and basically after five years, I probably had like 15, 20,000 subscribers. Okay. So which it's is like, up. It was about slowly, but it was, it was getting there. Yeah. And then I kind of switched where I did one video where I did like a teaching video. Because they used to do these fast arpeggio runs, and everybody's asking in the comments, dude, how do you do those, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, here's how you do it. Here's a system to learn it, blah, blah, blah. And then that video was doing way better than any of the cover videos did. And then I was like, oh, man, I actually might have a, a shot doing this. So then I started doing a lot more of the teaching videos. Those started taking off a lot more, and then I kind of switched the entire thing from more performing to more like the teaching aspect of it. Okay, so, you, so it took you five years to figure that out. Where you, that, that was the hook. Yeah, it took and, me and way you, too long. Yeah, and you, and you just grind it away, like you were just doing it for fun, and like you said, sharing with your friends. So, what did you do there? What were you doing? Are you working? How do you make money as a, a musician? Tell yeah, me, tell was, me the, the starving musician story. Yeah, essentially, like in college, <laughs> I was just like landscaping job over the summer. I would do little like little piano gigs here and there, played for a church, like that kind of thing. Uh, then moved to Nashville, and then I got a job doing digital marketing at an agency. Okay, and that helped a ton because eight hours a day, you're in there. And you're you're just working, and you're doing the exact same thing yeah. that then you can apply to your own business, essentially. Okay, so so you did that. For, okay, and then when did you decide to go full time into this? Um, it was about 2015. It was about a year and a half after I started the digital marketing job. Okay, um, and I actually started. I remember I was I did this big campaign for the digital marketing thing, mm -hmm. and like. Did really well because I worked super hard. I would come in early. Like, I was, like, super hard worker. 
And at the end of the year, I was like, look, you know, I've been working really hard. Like, can we talk about like the raise and stuff? They're like, yeah, we typically do the standard like three and a half percent or whatever. And I'm like, I worked this hard for like three and a half percent raise. And at that point, I was like, yo, I'm checked out. I'm doing my own thing. And I would literally spend like like I would come into the office and spend like the first half of the day just working on my own stuff. And then I would like grind it out for all my kind of work duties after that. Yeah, I mean, that's how I started my first business. I uh, I went and worked, you know, ridiculously long hours, and I came home and I kept working on my thing on the side. Mm -hmm. Eventually, it became my first company. But you have to kind of run those two jobs uh, at the same time sometimes. You, you got to pay the bills, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to work. Um, but it, it, I guess it's part of it is the determination to succeed, and, and especially when you're unhappy in your existing job, mm -hmm. you got to figure out a way out of there. Mm -hmm. And so you can change jobs, but if you want to start your own business, it's normally a side gig, uh, which gets to... Uh, some sort of, you know, either fundable or some sort of cash flow where you think, okay, I can do this full time. Yeah, especially too. I, I hear some people say like, yeah, burn the bridge, quit your job. It's going to motivate you to do your it's business. It's hard to do that. I'm <laughs> you like, you got to pay rent. <laughs> yeah, you got to pay rent. And even like you're starting your business, you're yeah. like, oh, I want to spend some money on ads. Yeah. Well, I don't have any money coming in. I kind of don't want to spend any money. Yeah. Whereas if you have money coming in, you're like, okay, well, let me budget a certain percentage that I'm going to kind of experiment with different things. Absolutely. You know? um, so, okay, so you, you you did this sort of crossover for a while. I mean, it's interesting, like 3.5%, um, it's not a raise. It's like an inflation adjustment. Pretty much, yeah, pretty yeah. much. So it, it is interesting. When you're working for companies, if you're, you know, they, they often look at, and I, I'm, I've i actually never been that type of guy. I always look at, like, what, what's the person's value to the company, how much they're doing, and do increases based on that. And sometimes if the company doesn't have money, you say, look, it's not a you thing. It's just we don't have the cash. Yeah. But yeah. if you're making, you know, I think that, I think uh, workers in America in particular, particularly are, are chronically underpaid mm. uh, for the amount of work they do, for the hours they put out. If you look at other parts of the world, I think they have way more benefits and way less hours they're putting in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, it's, a, it's something to think about. Um, so, yeah, and, and I guess in some ways that's, that's also what sort of spurs on the entrepreneurship in America because you realize, like, if you're not happy in your job and you're not happy doing what you're doing and you're not being paid enough for it, well, this so many opportunity to start your own business. And, yeah, and, and and get started. So stories like yours are actually pretty inspiring for people. Um, and so, well, I want to just dig in a bit on. So, how did you transition from having this salary to being able to just go it alone? Yeah. So basically, my rule was like, okay, once I'm making double what I'm making in my job, and back then I was making like three and a half, four k a month, something like that. So I was like, okay, once I make double that a month over my business for three months straight, yep. then I'm comfortable where I'm like, okay, even if I have a couple bad months in my business, I'm still making so much more that that's when I'm going to kind of go full time on it. I actually had almost the same thing. Uh, when I got to, yeah, about three times what I was making on the side, I was like, I don't need this job anymore. Yeah, and it doesn't make so, sense anymore. And I just, you know, I quit. And they were like, why, why are you quitting? I'm like, I, I'm making way more on the side, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, so... Uh, okay, so you, so you built this up on the side. Um, were you selling courses back then when you when you left, or was it just the ad revenue from from YouTube? No, definitely selling courses. Okay, selling yeah, courses. my ad revenue was like ten percent of my okay. revenue. Yeah. What platform did you use to sell sell your courses? Yeah, so I use Entreport, and then that ties into WordPress for my actual website, and then Stripe and PayPal for the payments. So my thing is like duct tape together with all like nowadays you have a lot of like simple solutions all in one kind of but back in the day it was like yeah. no you paste this code over here and then it doesn't work and you're on Reddit why isn't this working and yeah, then yeah. it's it's it was a hassle but yeah I have a lot of things duct taped together for so, sure uh, Frankenstein operation yeah 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 for sure for sure but that's fine I mean it, it still works I mean it's mm -hmm. a lot easier today for people to do this stuff there's uh, I was a seed investor in uh, Teachable oh yeah 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 you know those guys so they, uh -huh. they got acquired. Um, I think it was a Brazilian company a few years ago, so it was a good exit for everyone. Um, but, you know, they made it super easy to create your own courses, yeah. coursework. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the education space. I think if you've got, like, special skills or knowledge in a certain area, there's a wide open space worldwide, for, but then people want to learn about different things. And if you mm -hmm. can offer courses, like, what you're doing is actually a really, really interesting niche. Um, you know, learning piano. I invested in a company called uh, Tonebase. Have you seen them? Uh, I've heard of them. Yeah. I'm not sure so, too familiar, but uh, similar, like you know, education courses around. around um, I think it's mainly piano at this point, but they may have added other stuff. Um, so I, I'm I'm particularly interested in in in. I, I have no musical talent. <laughs> yeah, I, the the closest I got to doing music is buying a DJ turntable, <laughs> and I haven't figured out how to use it properly yet. So <laughs> I'll get to it eventually. But um, 
Yeah, so you, so you, you took something which is, you know, if, if you, let me ask you this. If you took away the, the teaching courses, how would you make money as a musician today? It's tough out there, man. It's really tough. Most people, it's like touring. They're making money touring. Uh, off of Spotify, you hardly make anything unless you're, like, huge. Um, it's even, like, merch. Like, how many T-shirts are you really selling? Mm. You sell a $20 T-shirt, okay, but it costs five bucks plus another three for shipping. Then you get returns. It's like you're not making that much. I don't know how people are making money unless you're either doing a lot of live gigs, which is a lot of, like, you're on the tour bus, blah blah blah. You like it's a lot of work, or you're doing something online. Yeah, or you, you know, back up, I guess back up, uh, or at least helping a big artist. I guess on stage. yeah, People yeah, quite a, uh, an artist uh, sort of troop. Um, yeah, because it's interesting when you look at musicians. Um, they, you know, there's a you know, there's there's this like long tail of musicians, and you got the you know the, the sort of the head where it's just all the the big names, and mm -hmm. and the long tail does struggle. Mm -hmm. They they struggle to make money. Um, and I, I, and I feel for them. I think there's, there's a, the, you know, the thing about this world we're living in right now, it, it, it's very cliche to say, oh, you know, do your passions and, you know, whatever, it'll take care of itself. But, like, you, it's hard to make money as an artist or a musician. It really is hard. Yeah. And if you're passionate about it, passion doesn't pay the bills, unfortunately. And so I look at guys like you and I'm like, wow, that's so great. Like someone who's living their passion, living their dream and able to make a good living for themselves as well. Mm -hmm. It's pretty powerful. Thanks. Yeah, I, I really think, like, when they have that discussion, you know, with whatever, like, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up kind of thing? Yeah. It is so centered around passion. It's like, do you really love this enough that you're okay being broke, potentially? Or is there something else you're also passionate about? Maybe not to the quite extent, but, hey, you're going to have this great lifestyle and you won't have to worry about bills. And for a lot of people... That path is a lot better than just like the follow your passion yeah. blindly kind of path, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I I I don't know too much about music, like technically, so I'm I'm a layperson listening to it. Mm -hmm. But how would you rate your skills as a musician? Obviously, you have a course, you have a ton of followers. Like, are you in the top point one percent, top one percent? Like, where do you think you are in the music world? At least as a pianist. Yeah, I mean, probably top five percent. Okay. To be honest, but like, there's definitely people way better than me at piano itself okay. but the reality with music there's a certain threshold you hit that 99 percent of the world is just like oh you're really good mm -hmm. and even getting better than that it's like yeah if you're like classically trained you could tell me that guy's better than that guy because his tone on the piano is slightly better and mm -hmm. he's a little bit cleaner with the notes but like most people don't even notice yeah, yeah. you know and the truth is most pop artists who are uber famous for xyz mm -hmm. aren't the best singer they're not some opera singer you know but they're really good at connecting with people they have a good image mm -hmm. maybe they have the right connections they have everything else yeah. that kind of helps them get to the top i heard an interesting thing actually one time that it's better not to be the best in your field but to be really really good in two separate fields mm -hmm. in terms of if you're a great musician and you're really good at the business side of things, okay, then that can work. If you're a great musician and you learn the YouTube algorithm really well, that can work. If you have two things, then it's like you don't have to be the best musician. Yeah, you yeah, can yeah. just be really good. That, that makes a lot of sense. That's a good way of looking at it. Um, you, you're effectively cross-multiplying your skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, it, it's, it's cool. So, okay, so this, tell me what, what, what is like the darkest moment you've had in the past couple of years building this business? Like where you were like, fuck it, I'm throwing in the towel. I mean, I wouldn't say it's a single moment, but it was just like the, especially the first like four or five years, just like uploading videos every week. And like, this is one that's going to pop off. You spend all this time like record, like learning the song, recording it, editing it. And back then I would like drag all my camera equipment in this like giant duffel bag from my house. I'd walk to campus, which was like probably half a mile, yeah. set it all up, all the lights, record it all, trudge everything back, do all the editing. And then you wake up and it's like, Oh, it got like 50 views. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, and then it's like, here's the, here we go again, you know? Uh, and like looking back, I wish I would have tried other things instead of just like trying what? to like, like what? Like start trying the teaching videos earlier, okay. for example, okay. Okay. instead of just like putting my head down and just ramming until yeah. hopefully it works someday kind of thing. Have you thought of running like conferences and events and sort of bringing people together? I have. The biggest thing for me though that I, I, I very purposely set up my business in a way. Um, that gives me like the maximum freedom. Okay. So I don't have any full-time employees. I have a couple like part-time like contractors that do support emails and that kind of thing. 
Um, but I don't teach any Skype lessons. I don't teach any in-person lessons. You, scale, you scaled yourself. Yeah, because I'm like, yeah, if I hire a bunch of people, I probably could make more money in the long run. Yeah. But then I lose the freedom of, okay, now I have to be managing people. Oh, this guy quit his job. Now we got to hire somebody. You know, it's like a lot of a lot of work. It's actually an important lesson I've learned when I was uh, younger in my, my career. So, there, there's some businesses that just shouldn't be scaled. Mm. I mean, I, I, had, I had a business that's making a ton of money. And then, you know, we started hiring people and building it up. And in the end, like, the profits actually just went down. Because mm -hmm. it's just hard to scale. When you, when you have a few people doing really well, like, you know, there's founders in the business. Um, there's often no reason to sort of scale it up. And that's one of the traps I think we see in Silicon Valley. Like, people raise way too much money for their businesses. Mm -hmm. And then they're forced to sort of, um, you know, keep hiring, keep burning cash. And that's where you, you have all these blow-ups where, um, you know, it, uh, they took in too much capital. They try to get too big too ahead of the market and the market wasn't big enough to sustain them. I mean, ultimately when it comes to revenues into a company, you can only make as much as the market can sustain. Mm -hmm. And so if you try and position yourself for market growth, that doesn't occur. You, you, you know, this is where the, the gap falls and people just run out of cash. Um, but you know, when, when you're looking at, so at the freedom that you get from this business, like what do you, you know, what do you do with your spare time? Yeah. So it kind of depends. Usually what I end up doing is I'll go, really hard on the business for like two, three months when I'm excited about it. Then I get burnt out and then I just focus on something else. Like I like, tell me about the burnout. Like why, why do you get to that point? I think it's just when I go hard, I go super hard. I mean, so I how have many hours a, a day. Like, what do you, what are you doing? Um, so, so basically I, I rented out the studio apartment that I kind of use as an office. I have the piano and all the lighting set up and I just have like a mattress in the walk-in closet, like a little foam mattress. And like, so when I'm in it, I'm like sleeping in the office. I wake up, I'm doing stuff most of the day, you know, recording, editing, and like batching a bunch of videos or whatever, whatever new course I'm doing at the moment. And then like, yeah, maybe like go to dinner with some friends, something like that, but then go back, sleep at the office, do the same thing the next day. It's like very mm. like dialed in. Okay, yeah. But I like that because no, I, it's I more motivating like that. that I, way I, I, I got friends you know? like that. Uh, I got friends who absolutely just grinded hard and they like, have to take two weeks break every single like few every few months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's and, what I do. and then you just like decompress. And I, I've like I've, I've gotten to the point in my life where I don't actually do. I do. I mean, I can take a week off here and then and and, and vacation, but that's fine. But I I try and go at like an even kill place um, mm -hmm. because I've been through the burnouts. That, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think like a three month burnout is not that bad when you grind for like one or two years nonstop. Oh, it, it takes yeah. its toll. That's like four hours a night sleep, three hours a night sleep. It's not good. Yeah. So how much? How many hours a night sleep do you get? I get usually like six, and then I. So how I kind of schedule things is, I get about six at night, and then I always nap every day. Oh really? And then I just let the nap take me, and usually it ends up being like hour, hour and a half nap. So it ends up being probably like seven, seven and a half. Okay. But my philosophy is like most of my social life, is just so unpredictable that a lot of times it ends up being super late at night. So I'm like, it's really hard to like, okay, I'm just going to sleep eight hours a night. Oh, but then tonight I stayed up till three in the morning because like we went out and now I got like five hours of sleep. So now I have to like make up that sleep. So now I just nap every day. And if I need the sleep, my body takes it. If I don't need the sleep, then I'll, you know, sleep for like 20 minutes kind of. And then just, okay, I'm good, I guess. So you, do you like, do you have like meetings? Do you ever use a calendar? Do you, how do you, sh like, what, what did your day look like typically? Yeah, not for... I don't really have <clears throat> much in terms of like talking to people like for my business. Yeah. So usually everything I can kind of do on my own. So usually mornings would be wake up and then I always have my like big goal of the day mm -hmm. that like, okay, even if I don't get anything else accomplished today, as, as long as I get this one thing done, it'll be a success. Okay. Make sure I get that done and then get, you know, a couple other things done. And then usually around like noon is like lunch, nap, uh, workout. And then I'll come back. Second half of the day is more like easier tasks, like maybe support, yeah. emails, like that kind of stuff. It's a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a. I mean, it's a really amazing life. Like if you think about it. Yeah, I you, love you, it. You I have mean, more freedom than ninety nine point nine percent of the world. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, it's, yeah. I, I guess in some ways, like you know, getting to this point where you have financial freedom, it's, it's very impressive what you've done, by the way. As a one, like literally a one man operation making you know seven figures a year. Thank uh, you. It's it's Thank very you. very impressive. Um, and I, and I think you've had the wisdom not to not to try and scale it up because you value your freedom, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's important. People need to uh, you know there's a lot of other things you can do in this life and explore, and so once you get to the point where you're doing your passion and you're 
you know, you're making money, um, you know, then then you at least can explore the other sides of yourself. So, like, have you taken up any other hobbies or any, have you tried, like, any other sports? Yeah, Span I learned Spanish. Okay. Learned salsa dance. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, just kind of like Oh, random, you got the free time, random. right? I learned vi- <laughs> how to play violin. Okay. And it's just kind of for fun. I'm, yeah. People are like, oh, you're doing a violin course? I'm like, nah, not really. Yeah. Like, a- any time I would spend on a violin course, I would make more money just, like, pushing the piano course further where I already have the following and all the experience and everything, you know. That's so it's just cool. kind of fun. So you play piano and violin, anything else? Guitar. Yeah. Guitar. And violin, guitar on a pretty basic level. Okay. But yeah, yeah. But it it's fun, it. though. Okay. Yeah. Um, what advice do you have for people who are, like, trying to figure out, especially the musicians, uh, they're trying to figure out their path forward, they're, you know, they're passionate about what they do, they're not making money, they may not be in California, uh, they may be in other parts of the country, like, uh, you, you know, how would you advise them to take their skills and, and make a career out of it? Yeah, I think picking one thing and, like, sticking with it hard for, like, three to six months and then see if it's working or not. I think a lot of people get distracted. Oh, I'm going to do TikTok because TikTok's hot right now. Then they do, like, seven TikTok videos. Oh, it didn't work. Okay, well, now I'm going to go to this live streaming platform. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, actually, I'm just going to get a manager and get a bunch of gigs. Oh, that didn't work. And it's too much hopping around versus, like, all right, I do YouTube well. I don't know how to do TikTok and make it work. I don't know how to make Twitter work. But, like, YouTube, if you want to do YouTube, like, I know how the algorithm works. I've studied it. I've tested so many different videos on it. I kind of know how to win at that game. Can you give us some tips? Yeah. Basically, YouTube algorithm is two things. It's watch time and it's click-through rate. So YouTube's a company. They're trying to make money, right? They make money off the ads that go on the video. So the longer somebody stays on YouTube, the more ads they watch, the more money YouTube makes. Mm -hmm. So the first thing they prioritize is watch time. So basically... Um, if somebody watches your video and then stays on YouTube for seven hours watching videos, YouTube thinks, man, this video really hooked somebody. So I'm going to show this video to more people. So then they're going to get hooked. And then we make a lot of money off the ad revenue. So increasing watch time. I mean, the obvious thing is you just have to make a video that's engaging and fun and entertaining and all the basics, just make a high quality video. Does length of time of the video matter? No, I think it should be the length. Basically, you should cut anything that's that's superfluous. Yeah, yeah, and make it as condensed as you can. Okay. But I've seen videos that are five minutes do really well, or videos that are twenty-five minutes. You know. Okay. But that's the hardest part. Is but what about, what about like when you go to a video and it's got bookmarks and you can see like ch- like chapters in the video and you can kind of skip ahead. Does that affect the algo? If someone skips ahead to like they say the second half of your video because they don't care about the first half. Not if it, it basically matters the total amount of time they're on okay. YouTube. So if they skip around your video, but then they click on your next video and then watch that one too, and then okay. click on a different video, watch that one too, it doesn't matter that they kind of like skipped around. Okay. Because so, um, I see a lot of the video guys on YouTube say, hey, you know, at the end of their video, like, uh, you know, watch this video next. Here's a link for the next clip, you know, and they try and keep you on. So trying to get people to stay on your videos, go from one to another is, I guess, part of the algo. Yeah, and now I, like, intentionally make videos where at the end, oh, by the way, if you want to learn more about part, this, part click here. Okay. If you want to learn about this, click here. I was given two options. Okay. And then see which one I do. Okay, that's great. So you, yeah. you know, and, and what's your average video length, you'd say? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. Yeah. That's great. And then where do you where do you see the most followers coming from? Like, uh, I mean, do you, are you able to track and see, um, what would, like, which videos get more followers for you and... Have you analyzed like what what gets you the followers? Yeah, it's the the really broad videos do the best. So, beginner piano lesson number one is like my top video, yeah. right? Okay. Three yeah, easy songs to learn on piano. If you're doing really niche stuff like pe- uh, pedal technique, for example, there's yeah. like the piano pedal, like that. Like this, like my video ranks really well. It just doesn't get many views because not many people are searching it. That, this is actually very very good and very practical lessons, I think. Um, so if someone is starting starting off and, you know, let's not take piano. Let's say they want to do, I don't know, uh, it's like something else, like just uh, cycling, something different. So you, you would suggest that they should go and do cycling videos for beginners, go after the widest possible audience, uh, very broad. Because, like, y- you can imagine, like, a video about technical cycling uh, on the uh, Tour de France, it would, you know, uh, how, how to maintain speed at high altitudes, whatever, you know, like it's a very small audience. People actually care about that video, right? Mm-hmm. But when, it, when it's like, hey, you know, how do you, how do you pedal, uh, you know, how, how do beginners 
how, how, what sort of cadence you're running as a beginner on a, on a long race, that's going to have a wider audience because people are trying to learn this stuff. Yeah, and I do think there's a, a potentially, like, you could do a market strategy where you go after, like, a really niche market and then you have a really high price course that's like, okay. yo, I'm the best at, like, not just learning how to cycle, but learning how to become the best in the world. Okay. That could be a strategy that works. My strategy is definitely more of the, like, let's get mass audience, let's get as many yeah. people to sign as possible kind of thing. And I think that's interesting because if you've got just mild skills, like when I say mild skills, if you're, if you're like a great eight pianist or, you know, you're not a classically trained, whatever, you can still probably build uh, piano courses for some niche. You know, 100%. But like for kindergarten, like let's do kindergarten piano courses and create a video about that and you'd see people, a lot of people going off there because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably a very wide audience mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. It narrows down when you become, you know, yeah, you know, how do you, how do you get into the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like maybe uh, two hundred people are gonna watch the video because they need to they need to figure it out. But um, or you know, so okay, so that's interesting. So your strategy has been to go after a broad a broad swath of the market, uh, you know, by offering beginner courses, maybe a bit more intermediate and some advanced courses as well. But targeting those people who want to learn because there's just a lot of people out there learning. And and I I tell people YouTube is one of the best places to learn. Mm -hmm. I've done clips on that as well, and I think it's it's a great place to, um, you know, it's kind of like the Matrix. Remember the uh, where where like Neo has to learn like martial arts or uh, uh, what's his name had to learn how to fly a helicopter. Uh, you know, Trinity had to like, get a download of this particular like it's kind of like that. But the interface that we have is our eyes. Mm -hmm. We don't have a direct interface into our brain just yet. But you can teach yourself anything on YouTube just about. There's like unlimited courses and. Uh, knowledge about pretty much every topic. I, yeah. I, I've been learning about oxalates. Do you know what oxalates are? No. <laughs> okay, it's basically these like, crystals that form in your body when you have lots of spinach and causes kidney stones and stuff. Crazy. And like, I was just Googling on, uh, well, I was in Google, then I went to uh, YouTube, and then I was like, started searching on YouTube for it. And I mean, there's so many videos about this stuff and how to like run a low oxalate diet and cut out all this stuff. And, and then all the doctors are talking about it. So it's, it's a great place to learn. Mm -hmm. about pretty much any topic. Um, and, uh, yeah, so so you see a lot of people building these YouTube video uh, businesses, right? Um, do you, like, go and meet with them? Do you ever have, good, like, conferences? Like, I think there's a VidCon, there's, is, uh, you know, industry-type uh, events. Do you do that? Yeah, not much, really. I think my – the piano niche is just so – like, people interested in learning piano that networking with – you know, someone with a big channel on, you know, more just news or yeah. dating or politics. It's just, it's just not much of a crossover. And even I've collaborated a couple times with big other big YouTube channels, and like I don't see much revenue from it. Like we'll do like little co collaborations. Uh. Oh, I'll show your course, affiliate links, something like that. And like it, it's like a little bump mm. in the revenue, and then it kind of goes back to normal. Yeah. And I just I haven't had like that much success with it. So are your courses all once off? Is any new to income in them? No, yeah, they're all once off. Once off. Yeah. Have you thought about building some sort of annuity income based, uh, you know, stream of, of cash? You're you're saying we're like we're they're paying like they pay you like twenty bucks a month for like uh, access or ten bucks a month for access to more things. Yeah. So I have options for, okay. like you know, twenty twenty seven bucks a month is like my price point okay. for like recurring, lifetime or like every month you pay and you keep access to the videos, and I found that. A lot of people will stay on, not a lot, but maybe like 10, 20 percent. We'll just keep paying the monthly just to keep access to the old videos. And to me, making more videos, maybe I would keep 30 percent on, maybe even 40 percent on. But the time I spent making those videos, I would be better spent making just my free YouTube videos that bring in more traffic. Okay. So like from a time perspective, it kind of makes sense to just keep working on the marketing side. Okay. Yeah. I mean... You know, 600,000 uh, subscribers is nothing to sneeze at, but there are millions of people out there trying to learn piano. Mm -hmm. So you you, you 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 probably haven't scratched the surface yet. There's a lot more that you can go. Yeah, for yeah, sure. So, and you for see sure. that, right? You're, like, how, how is your business growing every year? Like, what's the average growth rate? You do double every year? Do you go up 50%? What's your growth rate? Yeah, it's really different year year over year. Okay. Um, during COVID, it, like... Skyrocketed. Yeah, I was like almost tripled yeah. for no reason. I mean, I wasn't doing anything special. Did it go back down special. afterwards? Yeah, it went back down, but not down far enough okay. that like it's still up from like pre-covid you know what i mean yeah, like yeah. pretty significantly because yeah, i had more time on their hands during yeah COVID. Like, it was yeah. just it was just crazy i remember like 
I remember getting nervous about it because like the stock market tanked and I'm like, yeah. people are going to be like more like, oh, if anything, they're going to stop buying like piano courses, not a need. It's something yeah. that's like not that important. Not the case. No, opposite. Every, it took off like crazy. So, yeah, I mean, uh, there was a lot of uh, personal improvement. Um, you know, there's a big spike in the personal improvement market. I can yeah, yeah. COVID. And books as well. Yeah, yeah. And people bought a lot of books uh, over those first couple of months. Yeah, I got, and then on the flip side, I wasn't spending any money during COVID either because yeah, I wasn't exactly. like trying. So <laughs> like, it was really good for my like finances, and now it kind of flipped a little bit. But how do you save? What's your what's your strategy for saving money, and, and how do you like invest your cash? I, I'm very conservative. Eighty percent of it is S and P five hundred basic yeah. stocks. I got, uh, I had two real estate properties. I ended up selling one because it was in a like bad neighborhood yeah. on paper looked great and then tenants destroyed the property it would cost like so much money to fix it up it just didn't make sense and then i have about 10 percent in like crypto more like yeah, what cryptos do you like oh man uh i mean bitcoin and ethereum are like the main two yeah. solana is like the third that i have the most in i have someone like polka dot someone like v chain to be honest with you like i don't know other like Bitcoin and Ethereum, I'm like, okay, they'll come back. Like I lost some money, but yeah. I haven't sold anything. It'll yeah, come yeah. back. The rest of them, I don't know. I'm just like, well, I, I, hope. So, I mean, like, I'm biased. I was seed invest in Solana. I think Solana. Okay, Solana's gonna be fine. I hope so. Yeah, that's yeah, my yeah. third most. So, yeah, yeah, Solana's gonna be fine. That's good news. Uh, yeah. And I think that there's uh, the, the community is growing. It's still growing, and they're building great stuff. And we're in a bear market right now, and I've seen this happen before. I mean, I remember when 2018 or 19. Mm -hmm. I think it was 18, maybe 19, where Ethereum dropped down to 50 bucks. Mm. And, and now it's sitting at what, like 16, 1700? Yeah. So, you know, that was, and then that was, by the way, it, it had hit 1400 in 2017, went all the way down to 50, and it came back. And I expect the same will happen probably with Solana as well. Um, Do you think it's going to, the next halving, the 2024? Um, you know, it's, it is, it is coming. Um, I, I think it's hard to put a time on it, but I think that we're going to see, a crypto resurgence in the next 12 to 18 months. Okay. I think the having will have some some small role to play in it, but I think it's just general, you know, bear market building. But it's yeah. kind of funny, like, um, you know, even during COVID, uh, you know, we were in the crypto, the crypto market was kind of just recovering and then COVID hit and then like kind of reset us for a while. And then, then the, the government turned on the printers and they sent all the money to people. And then, you know, we had a 2021 like bonanza. And I always tell people like, Whenever it comes to these markets, like crypto markets, the bigger the party, the bigger the hangover. And uh, boy, yeah. did we party in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like 2017 was nothing as a party <laughs> compared to 2021. So, you know, if you look at it, took us like four years or three years and some change to recover from 2017. You know, and 2021, we partied hard. We've had the FTX blow up, a bunch of other things. We're down in... I, yeah, it could be 2025 before we see the light of day again. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of like stuff to be wiped out first. Yeah, yeah. Um, but okay, so yeah, you know, I, I I have a big background in crypto, but we're not going to spend the whole time talk talking about crypto. <laughs> I'm going to move on to some other things. So, so where do you live right now? Where's your where's home? West Hollywood. West Hollywood. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And uh, and why did you choose that? Um, basically wanted to move LA to LA originally because of the the you, music. Where, scene. Where are you from originally? Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Right. Yeah. So. And then I lived in Nashville for a couple of years. Okay. Uh, doing that whole thing mm -hmm. and it was good, but it was very country music based okay. um, They're like no, it's everything. I'm like, yeah, it's everything but mostly country. Okay, so then moved to LA uh, And the one person I knew that lived in LA we wanted to live in West Hollywood moved in with him and uh, one of my other buddies and now it's kind of the point where like There is part of me. That's like it's so expensive the yeah. taxes everything else the homeless problems getting worse blah 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 yeah. Like, should I move somewhere? But I have, like, so many friends here, and it's just, like, my whole social life's built here to, like, restart that yeah. right now. It's, like... People people ask me the same thing. Like, hey, Vinny, why haven't you moved to Puerto Rico to go avoid taxes on, yeah, on yeah, crypto yeah. or, like, every other crypto DJ out there? And it's it's like, well, you know, you sure, you can save on taxes, but, you know, are you going to be enjoying your life anymore? Mm -hmm. And so, I like, I'm super happy in california i'll pay my taxes i can i'll pay my taxes and hate the government but that's fine mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what we all do here right because like they're not they're, you know we don't get much for our taxes um but I, you're right it's all about like quality of life and there's some point too where it's like 
What else am I really gonna buy that's exactly. gonna make me happy? Like exactly. What do you do with all the extra money? Yeah, like, I'm just... gonna buy a yacht. Like I don't even go on yachts. Th- like I, I could already rent yachts and just go on it. You know, and like I'm how a big fan of renting. Yacht? I, I like if I, you know, like it, whether it's a, uh, you know, it, even like, yeah, you know, there's some tax benefits owning a private jet, but like. You know, you can just rent it. You can just pay for an hour or two year and day. How many hours a year are you going to fly? Yeah, you yeah. Know, the, the same with a yacht. Um, you know, you, who wants to maintain and manage a yacht? Oh, I heard it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. <laughs> it's a nightmare. And like with private jets, like I could understand it if like your business mm. every sure. three days you're sure. flying to New York, you're flying over here. But like but the, I have an it, online business. Like, but, I, I know. But it's, it's, I mean, the private jet thing is also it's just costly and it's pretty bad for the environment as well. Yeah, that's true and too. There's a bunch yeah. of other things. But uh, yeah, I think m- m- most people... Like I think, yeah, you know, it's interesting how we're moving to this world where we want to own less. Mm, like, yeah, I, I like I notice I want to own less. I want to have less stuff. Mm-hmm. Like when you're a kid, you're like, oh, I want to have that. I want to have that. I want to have that. And you keep sort of adding up all the things you don't have and all the things you wish for. Now it's like, yeah, I don't really want that in my house. I don't want to have extra space taking up. And so, so spring cleaning is actually a pretty uh, a pretty fun time for me. I try and get rid of all my old electronics and just get rid of. Stuff that accumulates. And the more you do it, the more you realize you can save a bunch of money not buying it in the first place. Yeah, I just moved. And, like, moving was just... I mean, it's always a hassle, yeah. but, like, it's, like, you're unboxing stuff. You're, like, what is even this? Like, when have I used this yeah. in the last three years? Like, you know, why do I still own this? Yeah, that's uh, true. Um, So, uh, you know, I, I want to discuss uh, what your plans for the future are. Like, what do you where do you see this going? I mean, you, you've got the, the one-man successful business you're running. Do you have... Any plans to do anything else? Is this what you're going to be doing the rest of your life? I think money-wise, probably it's going to be be mostly this. Just because I'm already happy at the point I'm at. I think just like spending a ton of time on a business that's a maybe when I could spend that same amount of time building this business, which is like almost guaranteed to make more money because I know what to do if I'm spending that time on it. I don't I don't think I would do anything else. So you see yourself primarily as a musician, not, not an entrepreneur? No, actually, the op- I, I you see yourself more as an entrepreneur. Than yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But you just focus on being a uh, an entrepreneur, like not a serial entrepreneur, like a single vision entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. Because I do, I like I do enjoy teaching piano and like thinking of new concepts and new way to teach and stuff like that. But even more than that, I enjoy the like challenge of okay, what if we put in this new marketing funnel? What if it converts at two percent higher than the last one? Okay, now, well now we can run ads way more ads because you know now we're getting more sales so we have more money to spend on ads that could snowball into this blah 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 like it, that stuff gets me excited more so than the teaching stuff mm-hmm. especially because like you know at, like i was saying on youtube it's the beginner stuff that really does well for me yeah so how many times have i taught you know easy piano lesson for beginners there's you can teach it different ways you can have different concepts here and there but at some point You've kind of done everything, you know. How do you avoid the temptation to, like, again, go back to the scaling up, like hire a few people, do more work, and build your brand, build things more? Like, how do you, how, how do you say no to that? Because it's, it's, it is tempting, right? Yeah, it is tempting. There's part of me that's like, yeah, what if I just took this to, I had a manager, ten million, hundred million dollars, something like that. Yeah. Um, I think it's just like the barrier of, like hiring and firing Mm -hmm. and going through that work of training somebody then you train someone for you know six months and then then they they leave and it's like man like now i'm back at square one Uh, you know and i have tons of stories like that trust me yeah i was like and then they go start competing businesses (laughs) man i bet Uh, i bet and then there's just the yeah i think a lot of it is like like i think it would be fun to have employees once I had a lot of employees and like a manager, I think then it would start to be fun because then you can offload a lot of it to the manager and you're not in there every day. But like my brain going through like all that time to get to a point where maybe my profit is still the same as it was before because, yeah, I'm making more money, but now I'm paying employees money too. So I'm just kind of like, yeah, I'm kind of happy monetarily where I'm at. Yeah. Um that's great. Uh, I think it's it's good to get to the point where you're just very happy and comfortable. Like I tell people as well, like it's, it's all about searching for happiness in life. Mm-hmm. It's like chasing money, you're not going to make you happy. Mm-hmm. So find what makes you happy and then make the money, you know, based upon that. The other thing is that's definitely a weakness of mine is like I'm definitely better at the technical side. I'm good at like very – I'm not as good as at the people side. Okay. And like yeah. – Well, it's, it's good to know yourself. That's great. Mm-hmm. Um and and how do you how do you maintain like a healthy work life balance? I know we spoke about it earlier on, but like, do you go to the gym? Do you like what do you what do you do to sort of balance out your 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 days? Yeah, gym's definitely the biggest thing. If I go, 
even like four or five days without working out, I feel it. You yeah, know, yeah. you're just like, Definitely. you're just kind of tired. You're just, you're not, you don't have that same like oomph that you typically have. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I honestly do more of the like sprint and then take two, three weeks off than, than the like, mm. you know, every day is, is more consistent. Okay. But exercise is important. Okay. Yeah. For um, sure. if you could change one thing in your career, what would it be and why? Ooh. I wish I would have spent less time in those first five years just pounding out those videos because I feel like I had so much like energy and determination. I'm like, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. And I just like spent so much of that energy like in a path that was never going to work, I guess. Why, why, like, why, why do you think it was that you, could, you just didn't decide to try something different? I think growing up, my dad's like super old school. He was a gym teacher, yeah. hated complainers, very big on commitment, stuff like that. Yeah. And like that just seemed like the way to go is like, just got to keep going. And, you know, you hear stuff on, you know, podcasts and stuff of like, yeah, you just got to keep grinding, which is true. Like there's definitely a standpoint of you just got to fucking outwork the problem, you know. Yeah. But then at some point, like you got to lift your head up and be like, wait, is what I'm doing working yeah. or should I like change to something else? Yeah, I mean, I think five years is a long time. I think uh, if you're trying something, like you said, if, if, if people were trying a channel like TikTok and you upload seven videos and you quit, that that's just too soon. Mm -hmm. But so what do you think the right amount of time is? Like how, how much time would someone put into doing something? Six months, 12 months? Yeah, I mean, obviously Basically it depends. Experience. But Basically like experience. I would say on average, like. Mi bare minimum like three months okay but probably like six months to a year to really see if something's working okay yeah yeah and, and i think with, with startups it's often a little bit more i find when you're actually building a company i could see that it's, that it's, makes it's, sense it's hard to figure out where you are for the first two or three years and after three years you gotta be making some revenue or, or building something up pretty quickly and then and trying to scale and if after like five years you're just sort of spinning your heels like it's Unless you're working on some really deep tech R and D problem that takes you know years and years to to research and develop, you probably you probably not going to find product market fit and build from there. And especially if you have no revenues, I see this happen with a lot of companies. And you know, it's, it's look, it's the continual pivot, right? So they just keep trying something different, trying something different, changing every like six months and whatever else, and burn through invest the money, and then you're done. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually, when you start a company that where you have revenue at the at the, you know, it's not always easy to do that, but when you have revenue at the outset, it's easier to optimize a business for revenue than it is to optimize a business with no revenue. Mm, Except mm -hmm. when you have user growth and usage, then there's a different metric you're chasing. Yeah, the the whole startup world is something that's like pretty foreign to me because like all my stuff is just like, oh, I did this. Did it work? Like, oh, I'm making some money, so it worked. Whereas startup world is more like, yeah, we're going to lose money for like seven years to yeah. get this many customers. It's not for everyone. Sudden, you know, it's, it's not like, for everyone. Yeah, like, it's, it's like, like tough. The startup world, I tell people, it's not for everyone. Like raising even seed money and venture capital money and like, you know, this is not for everyone. It's it's, it's, a, it's a highest stress environment. You you have to, um, you, you, you know, and, and there's a reason for this. So the reason that startup entrepreneurs are under more pressure because to do, to, so when a VC invests, in a portfolio of companies, let's say, let's say they take 10 bets. So sort of the, the conventional wisdom is something like you're going to have three losses, three break-evens, three winners, and hopefully a home run. And the, the, you know, the, if you look at it this way, like the break-evens and the losses uh, are effectively negative value because even when you break even on a cash on cash basis, there's some, you lose something in terms of the time value of money, et cetera, uh, and there's fees and whatever else. And then the three winners, if they don't make enough, to pay off the three losers and maybe the break even somewhat, um, you know, the fund's not going to look very good. Mm -hmm. And then the home run is what pays off the funds. So when you have a, a venture capital fund with 20, 30, 40 companies, they're just looking for maybe, you know, four or five home runs that basically pay off everything else. Mm -hmm. And so they need you to swing for the fences. Mm -hmm. So when, they invest, when a VC invests in you and gives you a check, they need you to return 10x plus that money. And if you're going to just be a break even or like a, a, a you know, a, kind of a boring winner, uh, it's not going to make a difference in their lives because they, they've got to cover all the losses they're going to hit in the portfolio. I see. So they, they want you to be kind of risky. That, well, that's exactly it. They, I see. They need, so that's why the focus has often been not on revenues in the early stages, just growth, 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 and, you know, user growth or whatever. And even if it is revenue, it's not always profitable revenue growth. It's like mm -hmm. we don't care if we're losing money in every transaction because we want to get to scale so we can reduce costs and and get market share and whatever other arguments they use. And 
the unfortunate part of that is, as a as an entrepreneur, you're just one in. Let's just say it's a fifty a fifty company portfolio. You're one in fifty companies. Mm-hmm. So you know they get the ch- they get the opportunity to r- spread their risk, find the five or six or seven winners out of their portfolio, and the rest can go. Well, sorry guys, you should have luck. Go raise yeah. money for your next company. But in the meantime, you've lost five years of your life doing that. Yeah, that you is know? crazy. And, and so on an individual basis. You know, there's there's gonna be like, you know, let's say half the portfolio bunch, you know, are losers or twenty twenty out of fifty are losers. Um, you know, those are twenty people, or maybe in thirty or forty if they have co founders that basically spend years of their life trying to make something happen and they failed. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, so it's 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 the game, right? So it's not like, you know, not that the VCs are doing anything wrong. Mm-hmm. That's just how the math works out. Yeah. And the math works out that the winners have to be big, big winners. And that's the thing, too. I mean, it balances out risk reward wise, where it's like, yeah. okay, my business is doing well. It's never going to be a billion dollar yeah. business. Yeah. And I'm fine with that. Exactly. Whereas, like, you do a big startup, you might make zero, or you might be like in massive debt, or you might make like a billion dollars. So. And that's exactly that's the risk. That's, that's, the, that's the, the risk and reward that you have to, you, you have to play out. Um, and, so when, when I think about when I think about this, I'm trying to give advice to entrepreneurs. I, like my first bit of advice is like, why are you doing it? Mm-hmm. You know, and what's your, what's the reason for it? And and um, you know, why are you raising capital for this? Um, obviously, everyone needs capital to grow, but like, you know, most of the time, if the answer is, well, we have to build the product first, that's actually you, and, and it costs money for engineers and hiring, and that's a good reason to raise the capital. Mm-hmm. Um, but then. The people giving the money need to know that it's a bigger market. It's a big market opportunity, and they want to invest in that. If if it's more like, you know, when people come to me with businesses that are um, profitable, or at least making decent revenues with decent margins, and they're early on, unless they need a lot of capital to sort of bridge the divide, my advice to them is just get to profitability, mm-hmm. get to cash or positive. Once you're there, you can just reinvest the cash and grow it at whatever pace you need to grow it. Don't take the outside capital. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sure, it'll work out sometimes, but I've seen it go both ways. And you put this sort of heavy burden on your cap table um, for your investors where they, you know, they need you to make a, a, you know, a 5, 10x return uh, on, on the last valuation. So you have to work your butt up to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if you're just, you know, a profitable company and you have, maybe you can have some investors, people put some money in, but it's not venture capital style investors. They just want like a, a decent return. Get to profitability and pay people dividends. It's like very old school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but it works. Yeah. Yeah. My parents always watch like Shark Tank and they're like, Zach, you should go on Shark Tank with yeah. your business. I'm like, why? Like, what, what am I going to use the money for? I could just use the money I make already Absolutely. for whatever I needed it for. You Absolutely. Know? And so. as someone who sits on Shark Tank, South Africa. <laughs> oh, yeah? Did, you know, I'm, I'm a shark. Yeah, oh, yeah. wow. Nice. Yeah, nice. Yeah. I can tell you. It's, That's I, sick. I see a lot of these businesses doing this and uh, um, they come in and, you know, it, it's 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 funny how profitable businesses that come on the show they want equity and capital because they just need help to grow and get marketing and you know they don't really need the cash they just want the expertise mm-hmm. and it's interesting because you you know it's, it's a it's I mean, for investors that's a great deal you, you're buying into a, a profitable business that's gonna you can help grow mm-hmm. and Shark Tank USA actually um, the stats on it are pretty phenomenal it's it's a really good. Um, they get great valuations. The uh, it's been a very profitable venture for all the sharks, yeah, because they get access to really good deal flow at good prices. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the flip side is, you know, you invest in this company, you know, it's going to be on. You know, when the show airs, everyone's going to go crazy buying that stuff, and you're basically guaranteeing the entrepreneurs a whole bunch of extra sales. Yeah. So, so the, I think one of the reasons for doing Shark Tank is the publicity. I think some people do that, and they yeah. have some insanely high valuations. They, they just want the market. Yeah, they do that. We, we, I had a couple of guys come on the show with like stupid valuation, like you just here for some PR. Yeah, 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 hundred uh, yeah. percent. Okay, so let's let's jump into some rapid fire questions. Um, what's your top book, podcast, article? What do you recommend? Ooh, I love the Tim Ferriss podcast and all his books too. Really? Yeah, Four Hour Work Week was one of the first one. I saw you got Tools of Titans yeah, down there. I'm yeah, yeah. For, yeah, right behind you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Four Hour Work Week. I remember reading that and just being jacked up about, okay, I could do all this myself. Yeah. I can hire a VA for this, you know, and you, like, you, want, you, want, you so that, that book came out in 2006, I think, or five. It's a lot, yeah. yeah, yeah. So actually funny thing, he wrote about my company in South Africa. No in, way. In, in that book, yeah. My Crazy. first company I started, he wrote about us. That's insane. Yeah. Did right. you read the book then? Like, and yeah, you yeah. randomly saw it, or did somebody tell no, you? Someone, oh, t- someone told me about it. In that okay. book. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's funny too because a lot of the stuff in there now is like so mainstream and so obvious. But like back then, it was like, wait, you can hire like a virtual assistant yeah, yeah. for like really cheap and blah blah blah. Yeah. Like you know all this. I know, stuff I know. It's, 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 it was he was very like uh, foresightful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There was also another book by um, uh, Thomas Friedman called uh, "The World Is Flat," where it's quite amazing. Back in those days, like 15, 16, 17 years ago, talking about how. You'll be able to just outsource things in any, any any part of the world, um, hiring assistants anywhere, uh, developers everywhere, and that was a trend that was growing. And with all the compute technology we have today, with remote access and being able to do things uh, with cloud computing, uh, it's become that's become what's you know the norm. Yeah, it all came true. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Okay, so what's your what's your go to habit that you think everyone should implement in their daily routine? Um. Every morning when I wake up, I always do some kind of motivation thing. So one thing that I really like doing, I go on like Google Slides, put a bunch of motivating picture, kind of like vision board type of stuff. And then I just put some like hype music on and I wake up and I just, I have a projector that like projects onto one of my walls and I just click through the slides while I'm listening to some hype music. And that just kind of gets you going, start the day. That's pretty cool. Um, do you meditate? Mm -mm. Uh. My uh, working out is kind of like, I guess my meditation. I'll like go for a run or something. Yeah, it's meditative as well. Yeah. Um, what's the best bit of financial advice you've ever received? Ooh. Somebody told me once, you can't save your way to getting rich. And basically he was like, yeah, you can like cancel your $10 a month to Netflix and like cancel this and cancel this. But like if you want to get like rich – you got to, like, make more money. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, yes, you should probably save, too, and, like, that's, like, good financial habits and stuff like that. But if you really, like, want to make more money, you got to, like, switch your job, start a business, change your career, or something like that. That's, that's my philosophy, too. I actually made a clip about that. Oh, no way. I, I will link it in the show notes below. But Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's exactly what I said. Actually, um, it was, we just released it, uh, and uh, it's... It's true. You, 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 you just can't save. You can't save yourself. Like, I always tell people, just make more money. Yeah, yeah. Just like if you know, making yourself unhappy by cutting costs is not the way. Mm -hmm. Figure out how to make more money. Yeah, and I think a lot of people too are are stuck at a job based on like kind of just inertia. Yeah, like also location. So like I I will give it like the I do have some of the people who are stuck in a geographical location that may be difficult for them to operate under or make money in. Um, but that's why people move. That's why you know America is what it is today because people moved from countries around the world. Where they just weren't happy, they didn't see a, a path to success. They came to America and, you know, lived the American dream. It's 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 um, you know as an entrepreneur who's done that, moved to the states. I think that being mobile and being willing to move out of your small town, you know, dirt road place that you live to a big city to a place where you can achieve what you want to achieve is great. And I'm not saying you have to you know leave. Everyone has to leave where they are and move to the big cities. But if you want more out of life and you're geographic location doesn't afford you the opportunity to, to achieve that. You have to think about why you're living there. And sometimes it's, you know, you're stuck, you have, you have kids, maybe uh, mm -hmm. you know, divorced and you, you know, custody issues or, or, or you have to take care of sick parents or whatever the case is. I, and I feel people are like that, but if you, if you don't have those constraints, you ask yourself, you know, why are you still living there if you're not achieving your dreams? Yeah. And that's why I think too, like if you don't have kids, like I would not buy a house. I'll just rent because what if you get an opportunity where you're going to make an extra 50K a year, but it's in a different part of town and now you got to commute two hours or you can just move there. You know? I've, I've, I've always been the live close to where you work type of guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the, the, the few times that uh, in the Bay Area, like I, I lived there for a while and we lived in like a place called Los Altos and then San Francisco was um, only like 35 miles, but it would take... It was 35 miles or so. Um, we take um, hour and 45 most mornings to get to this. And like, eventually I was like, I'm done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I threw the towel and I, I left and I moved down to San Diego. I'm like, I'm not doing this stupid commute anymore because I just can't do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how people spend hours a day commuting. Um, podcasts are a good way to get past their time. So I'm mm -hmm. glad people, you know, have the opportunity to listen to podcasts and obviously listen to this podcast. If you're busy driving, it's great. Um I do that a lot. So I use podcasts when I'm driving to LA or wherever else. Mm -hmm. Pass the time. Um, what's a common misconception about business or life that you'd like to set the record straight on? I think for most businesses, people think the important part is like 
the product, building the website, getting the business cards, doing all the cool business, setting up the, the glitzy LLC. stuff, the glitzy stuff. When I think for most businesses, it's how do you get someone to show up? take out their wallet and give you the money. Yeah. You know, it's it's sales yep. and marketing. That's the hard part. And people think, oh, I want to start a business because I have this great like chicken recipe. And it's like, great, but how do you make people buy actually it. buy the chicken versus anywhere else? Yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Um, if you could go back in time and meet one person in history, who would it be and why? Oh, man. And it could be a living person as well. So, okay. So... I feel like Thomas Edison, because people always said that he kind of had, was so good at so many things, but also, like, like people don't give him a lot of credit for, like, his business sense, but I guess he had, like, was really good business-wise, too. Yeah. yeah. He's, uh, I mean, you know, uh, isn't, like, AT&T, wasn't, didn't he start AT&T? Something like that. Yeah. And or, even, or Bell, like... It was Bell or something. Yeah, and even, like, a lot of his ideas supposedly, like, Tesla created, I think. Yeah. But then he got the credit for him because he was better at marketing. Like, he just, like, figured out how to market himself as, like, the thought leader. Or I mean, Edison was one of the greats in history. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Um, and, he, you know, it's, these guys kind of leave their footprint on society for, for, for generations, even centuries, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, Elon Musk, for people today, yeah, would probably be the one. E I, Elon's probably going to be the guy. I mean, he... I he, think he's the GOAT. Yeah, I mean. yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're going to get to... We're going to get to Mars or even the moon. I mean, we don't have to get to it. We, the fact that we've got, like, Starlink. Yeah. It's just incredible. Uh, and and what he's done with, 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 the, with the rockets and the uh, um, reusable rockets is just incredible. Like, the way he's dropped the cost of space. SpaceX. I mean, the guy, if you think about the guy's put together over a trillion dollars worth of companies. It's crazy. And and he might be the first person to create three trillion dollar companies separately. Like if you look at Tesla hit a trillion, SpaceX will probably hit a trillion as well. Mm -hmm. Um you know, maybe maybe X is a trillion, maybe it's Neuralink, maybe what but he, he he could be the most successful entrepreneur in history. He's already the probably arguably the most successful already. Yeah. Uh, but he could like really hit it out the park. I mean yeah, because you look at like Steve Jobs, obviously phenomenal yeah. entrepreneur. Yeah. But, like, when you look at Musk compared to Jobs, like, yeah, yeah Steve Jobs he invented, like, a computer that's, like, smaller and fits in your hand. Like, don't get me wrong, like, amazing feat yeah. of technology and everything, but, like, Musk is, like, sending rockets to the yeah. to space. Like, yeah. it, to me, it's just, like, a different level. I don't yeah. know. He's, he's, I think he's launched more rockets in space than NASA at this point. I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't doubt I'm probably, like, one-fifth of the cost, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's been great. Well, hey, it's been great to have you here, Zach. Thank you so much. Uh, great having you on the show. Um, final shout outs and, and whatever else you want to add to, like, you know, what's your URL? Your, I think we'll have some of your links uh, in the show notes below as well. Yeah, just YouTube. If you want to learn piano, uh, Piano Superhuman, type it on YouTube and all the links will kind of flow from that. So Perfect. Great. Awesome. Thanks for Thanks, having man. me. Good to have you.